Hey everyone, welcome back to the lab. In this video, we're gonna be talking about web scraping with F Sharp and Selenium. All right, so why are we talking about this? Well, basically I wanted to build a archive of screenshots of a website over time, which basically involves like, you know, setting up some project code, uh, going send that to the website and then automatically saving off those screenshots somewhere. But you know, I don't wanna do that myself. So probably want something to do it automatic. And of course I wanted to build this with F Sharp. You know, I use Cloud Seed for basically all of of my starting projects, uh, which runs F sharp on the back end. And so if I want to build some kind of ad hoc business logic, I like to try and keep it in the same kind of technology. Uh, so we're doing F sharp here. So the goal of this project um, was to basically figure out how can we build basic web scraping with F sharp um, and really hitting on some of the core basic elements that you'll need for most kinds of web scrapers. So things like how do you actually parse the, the elements of a page? How do you like simulate browser actions like page clicks? And then how do you actually get screenshots? Because that was like the whole goal of my end projects that I wanted to kind of try out and prototype. So the answer to this and the example project I'm going to be showing today is basically a dockerized F sharp.net project using Selenium uh, for the web drivers. Um, so for this, I'm using Docker for that kind of like deterministic um, infrastructure as code environment. I build most things with Docker. So of course, I wanted to do it here. F sharp.net, as I mentioned, is a big constraint that I wanted to build um, into this project. And then I just chose to go with Selenium because it's a, a mature web driver that works across um, a lot of different languages technologies, well-supported, um, stuff like that. There are other drivers out there, but I think Selenium is probably the most mainstream one. Um, and so that's why I went with it. All right, now before we get into specifics, um, the full project and all the source code I'm gonna show you today is available at hami.xyz, uh, which will be linked below. Okay, so now in the rest of this video, what we're gonna do is dive into kind of the specifics of how each of these parts work, um, starting with the solution overview, so you can kind of understand exactly what this thing is trying to do and how it does it. Uh, we're gonna then go into the infrastructure structure that allows this stuff to work, starting with our Selenium Docker container. And then we're going to dive into the application code of our F Sharp project that runs all of this stuff. All right, so let's start with the solution overview. So basically, what we're going to be building um, for this example app is a simple New York Times scraper. Now I could have scraped a lot of websites. Um, but basically, I wanted something that would allow us to test out a lot of these different elements of a web scraper. Um, and so when I think about web scraping, basically, what you want to do is go to a website, get some information, parse it out, and then uh, like do something with that info. And when I was thinking of this, it's like a list of things. And so I was like, oh, we probably want something with repeatable elements that shows we can iterate over it. And that made me think of a newspaper. And that made me think of uh, the New York Times. So that's why I chose it. But you could do anything like, I don't know, Wikipedia, maybe like a Google results page, doesn't really matter. But this is the one we're building. Uh, and basically what our project is going to do is first spin up a container, and it's going to set up all the infrastructure it needs for um, actually building and running this project. It's going to start an internal Chrome browser, it's going to navigate to that New York Times website, it's going to click through any pop-ups um, that might appear that might block its uh, scraping. It's then going to take a screenshot and save that off to our operating system. And then finally, it's going to print out all those article headings um, to the console just so we can see that it can do it. And you can imagine you might want to, I don't know, save this to a file or do something else. But for us, printing to the console is fine. That's a lot of text. So here's kind of this same thing um, in visual format. Um, so this is basically the system design. Just run this on your you know, laptop or computer. We're going to be using Docker Compose as our entry point because again, I like deterministic infrastructure as code builds, um, things that makes things much, much simpler. Um, and the first thing it's going to do is it's going to connect a volume, which is how we're going to connect our local file system with this kind of containerized um, file system. And we're going to need this because if we're saving off screenshots, um, usually your container is isolated from your operating system. So there's no way to get at this files later. Um, so we're connecting this volume to make it much uh, easier for us to access as humans. So that's the first thing it does. And um, then it's going to start spinning up these uh, Docker containers. First one is going to do is going to take that F sharp project and build it. And then it's going to export that as a standalone executable. Um, this is going to be useful again for isolation between Docker container layers. Um, then it's going to start up another Docker container, which is going to set up Selenium, which is going to pull in everything it needs to have Chrome web browser and be able to drive that browser. And then it's going to run our application code, which will actually do the driving of it, which is going to send it to the website and allow us to do things like loading the web page, clicking on elements, um, taking screenshots and stuff like awesome. Now, as always, I don't want you to take my word for things. Uh, I want to be able to show you uh, that this thing actually does what it does. So here I am in my VS Code editor. I have the project open and we're going to run this thing to show you what it's doing. So here I'm going to spin up Docker Compose and it's going to do a bunch of things. First, it's going to spin down my uh, existing containers, if any. It's going to rebuild everything to prove that this is actually the code that's you know building the image. And then it's going to run that image for us. So we can see it's doing its little buildy stuff and then looks like it's actually running the image here and it's outputting 
adjusting some things, starting Chrome, uh, giving us an error, uh, which hopefully isn't too bad. Um, and then it's going to print out all of these uh, titles of the articles that it found on the website. Um, so that's most of the things I showed you. And then last thing I want to show you is what the screenshot looks like. So this is the screenshot um, that it output into the container. And then because I have connected my volume, it comes out into this folder here. So that's what it does. Now we're going to go into all this code um, in a minute. Um, but I want to give you again, the overview of each section, and then hopefully the code actually makes more sense of what it does. So let's get into that. Okay, uh, so the first thing that I think is important to talk about is the Docker uh, containers um, that we're creating to make this work. Because I have a feeling this is probably where most people are going to get stuck when they're trying to uh, do this web scraping. And so I first want to start off like why Docker containers like isn't this overkill. Um, and yes, it looks like overkill from the outside. But this little bit of extra work front actually saves us a lot of trouble in the long run. Um, and so I really love building in containers. And I think this is a great example of why containers went out in the long run over doing like these kind of manual setups. And so just looking at Selenium, what you actually need for it to run um, is basically to pull in the right browser that you want. So this is Chrome, Firefox, Safari, uh, whatever it is. But then you also need to pull in a web driver. And the web driver is what's actually going to allow you to control that browser. Um, and so you, you need the one that goes with the chosen browser you have. But then you also need to make sure that the versioning is set up uh, correctly. Because if you get the wrong version, it just won't work. And then you also need to make sure that each of these things, the web driver and the browser are the right version being pointed to by um, other processes. So you need to make sure it's in the right file location. You need to make sure it's named the right thing. You need to make sure it's like connected to your path or whatever OS you're using knows how to like look, look things up, which doesn't seem like that much stuff until you try it yourself. Uh, and then you're probably going to get it wrong for like, you know, 30 minutes to an hour um, and then be like, this sucks and it's going to suck even more to, to upgrade. And so the Docker container, especially the official ones that you'll get from Selenium's repo, basically do all this stuff for you. So you don't even have to worry about it. You just pick the one you want. Um, it sets all this stuff up and you can just set it and forget it, uh, which is just way better than doing it manually. Okay, so that's Docker, um, which hopefully makes sense. But why do we want the Docker Compose? Um, now the Docker Compose, a lot of people don't use it as much. They'll just use the straight Docker container with the command line arguments. I think that's fine. But in my opinion, Docker Compose makes Docker better because it allows you to move more things out of like command line arguments and these ad hoc things you might have to remember store in like a note somewhere into uh, an actual configuration file that does things for you. And so our Docker Compose, which I'll show you in a second, basically does a few things that you'd otherwise have to figure out or remember to put in your command line. And that's setting the, the container name. So this takes care of like the tag, um, setting the Docker file location and context, which is very helpful if you have a lot of different uh, containers in one repo, um, which I do have for these example projects. And then the last one that's really important for this specific case is it's going to allow us to set up a deterministic um, system to container volume. And again, this is how we're going to get access to those screenshots later. You can do this for you via command line, but you're going to have to remember this. Um, and you're going to have to like store this command somewhere. Uh, so why not just put it in like a file that actually does the thing. So let me just show you that uh, while we're here. So here I am again in uh, VS Code. We're going into Docker Compose. Um, and here's what this looks like. It's very simple. Again, this code is, will be available on my website, but just gives the, the Docker Compose version. We are giving it a service name. We're setting the name of the container, which is again, like your dash T tag. And then we're setting the volume. And so we're saying, hey, my local file system screenshots out. We want to uh, connect this to this part of the container file system, which again makes this connection a little bit more deterministic. All right, so that's the Docker Compose. Um, the next thing is the Docker container. And there's basically two layers of this that we're building. The first is the F -sharp .net, uh, which again is going to take our code, um, install all the dependencies, build the project. And then it's importantly going to export this as a self-contained executable. Now, we don't necessarily need to do this. Um, we could have basically gotten Selenium and the .NET SDK and stuff in the same container, but it's actually much harder to do that. And the idea of containers is that you have these layers of abstraction. And so you try not to mix the, the layers if you can. And so this is just making a lot easier for us that we can actually export as a self-contained executable, um, which I'll show you when, when we look at the, the Docker file in a second. Um, the next layer is going to be Selenium. And so this is what's actually, you know, installing that uh, web browser. It's installing that web driver. Um, it's setting up all the path variables and everything else you need to actually get it to work nicely. And then it's going to copy in that F-sharp executable from the previous layer into its layer. And then it's going to run the project. And that's going to allow us to actually connect the application code with all of the infrastructure that we've set up. And so here's what it looks like. We're in the Docker file. Um, first, we're going to build this project. So we're just pulling in uh, the you know official .NET SDK version 7. We're going to be copying in our fsproj. We're going to be doing .NET restore. And then we're going to just do a .NET pub 
established here, um, which is our self-contained on Linux 64. Uh, most of these Docker containers are running Linux 64 of some kind, so this is usually pretty good um, default. Uh, here's the next layer. It's very simple um, because you know the standalone Chrome uh, Selenium is taking care of this stuff for us. If you wanted to use Firefox or Safari, this is probably where you'd change that. And you can see all the different versions they have on the you know Selenium official Docker Hub. Uh, then we're just going to copy in the standalone .NET that we created, and then we're just going to run it. And that's the Docker file. Okay, so that's all the infrastructure. So if you've gotten past that, then this um, application code should be uh, much easier to understand. Now there's two dependencies that I want to call out here. Uh, the first is a Selenium web driver, which is going to give us like access to the interfaces and stuff for actually to drive uh, whatever browser it is we want. Um, but the second thing you'll need is the specific uh, NuGet package for the driver that you want. So again, I'm using Chrome. So the Docker image that we're pulling is the, the Chrome Docker image. But if you wanted to use Firefox, then you would also need to, uh, you know, update the Docker file to get the right image, but also change it so you have the correct driver um, in your application code. Okay, so now that we've done this, our application code does a few things. Uh, you know, it's going to spin up our Chrome driver, which is actually going to spin up an internal instance of uh, Google Chrome. It's going to navigate to the New York Times website. It's going to check if the pop-up exists um, and then click through it if so. It's going to take a screenshot and save it to our file system, which is the same place that we um, set up our volume in the Docker Compose. And then it's going to parse all H3 tags and print them out to console so we can see that it's actually parsing the data. And so here I am back in the project um, and my program.fs. We're printing out to show that we're actually running it. Um, we are just opening up the libraries that we need. Um, and then we're going to set up our Chrome driver. So I wasn't able to get this working with the default option. So I was just clicking around trying to figure out how other people got it working. And these are the options they picked. I don't really know why they're the ones that work, but they're the ones that work. Um, so just, I don't know, go with it and use it. Um, so we're setting up these Chrome options. We're passing it to our Chrome driver. And this is going to take a few seconds um, because it's actually, you know, spinning up that internal instance of Chrome, making sure it can control it, stuff like that. And then first thing we're going to do is navigate to our web page. So we just do driver.navigate.go to URL. Um, here we're going to New York Times, but of course, if you wanted a different URL, this is where you do it. And then we're just printing out our title to make sure um, that we are actually uh, there. And if I scroll up on the outputs here, we should see that somewhere. Yep, right here. The next thing we're going to do is deal with this compliance overlay. So sometimes if you go to this website, um, there's this pop up. And if you don't deal with the pop up, it's going to like not let you see the rest of stuff. Um, I kept this in here because I think this is actually quite common. The web scraping, you run into all these random like edge cases. And so I think it's important to see like how you might deal with that. Um, so first thing we do is we try to find this compliance overlay. Uh, we're using driver.find elements. And then we look for this ID, which I just, you know, by clicking through the website, realize this is the ID on it. And so that's how we're going to find it. Um, we know that if it's present, if the count of this is greater than zero, so we're able to find one. And then what we're going to do is if it's present, we're going to look um, basically into the element that we pulled, and then we're going to find an element within it. And the way that this works is it's like, you know, an HTML page is nested tags. Um, and so by pulling out this element, we're basically only looking at that element and its children. Um, and so we're, when we find element on here, we're looking for the button that's within this compliance element. And if we find it, we're just going to click on it. That's how we're doing with the compliance overlay. I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Um, and the next thing we do is we've we've now gotten to the full website. So I want that screenshot. I'm saving it off here. Uh, this is the directory of the container um, volume that I set up. So I set this uh, connects to my local file system screenshots out. Just setting it to a new GUID. I'm saving it as PNG. And then the next thing we want to do is just find all articles. Um, I'm just doing a dumb search here. So I'm just like, hey, find all the elements on the web page that have an H3 tag. I just from eyeballing the web page looks like everything's an H3. Get the text off the element. Uh, only use the ones where the length of that text is greater than zero. Um, and then make it a list. And then I'm just printing it out. And we can see here the output is uh, all these, you know, title looking thing. And that's it. Um, wanted to show you an example of what this pop up looks like that was blocking us and why we had that like little complexity here is if you just go to it it's going to be like we updated our terms and so if you don't click uh, continue on this you can't get access to the actual page so you know a little bit more complex than it needs to be but this is extremely common on on websites to have like random stuff pop up um, so most web scrapers will have to do with like ad hoc cases like this all right that's it i know i went through a lot of code uh here so all project and source code is available again on my website um, and hominian subscribers get full access to the project source so you can kind of just run it yourself. Links to all of those and more information is available here, uh, which I'll also have linked below. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.